It's okay. I, I fixed the problem now. Okay, we're back on track. <laughs> this new technology, if you don't keep up date with it, it'll throw you off. So I apologize for that. Okay, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 46, right? But like I said earlier, before we look at that, we want to um, look at page seven of our notes that I hand to the members here at Christian Bible Chapel. And if you need the notes, uh, you can email me at um, uh, Sherm, at Harris Sherman 4 at gmail.com. That's Sher Harris Sherman 4 at gmail.com. Other than that, we're going to look at page seven, where it says judge twice. All right. Now, what we were saying is that if the doctrine of the soul going to heaven or hell immediately at the death of a person would, if they go straight to heaven, if they go straight to hell, then that means that there's going to be a judging for each person, whether in heaven or hell, two times. And why do we say that? Because remember, the scripture teaches that in John chapter 14, let me let me quote that. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. There's the clause. I will receive you unto myself. In other words, if you're already in heaven, how is Jesus is going to receive you? So we're dealing with the resurrection. That's the purpose of Jesus coming back to resurrect the dead, to judge the dead. Okay? The, the righteous will live forever with him while the unrighteous will face or be sentenced to the lake of fire, as the scripture says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, the lake of fire is the second death. Now, we must, we must get out of our minds, our human mind, in an English way, that a lake is a lake. Like we know a lake. Like Lake Missouri or Lake Michigan. The Bible does not speak of the lake of fire as a lake, like we know a lake, water, uh, encompassed with land on both sides. That's not the Bible definition of a lake. When we see in the scripture, the metaphor or the symbolic in Revelations, when it talks about the lake of fire, John tells us what the lake of fire is. Whosoever name was not found written in the book of life was sentenced. That's the word cast in the King James. It means sentence, like the judge is going to sentence you in court to 20 years or life. The word cast, just like lake of fire, does not mean our English definition. We took it literally, and we think it's a lake, a body of water, a body of fire burning. That is not the definition. Just like the word cast. They was cast into the lake of fire. In the Greek, the word cast in King James is cast in many translations. But in the Greek, it is sentence. Whosoever name was not found written in the book of life was sentenced to the lake of fire. Which is, there it is in, in black and white, which is the second death. Now, what is the second death? The second death is a death that a person will experience, only humans will experience, and they'll never be resurrected again. They will be totally obliterated, gone. That's it. That's what death is. And that's what death is. You're dead, you're dead. Physical death, when this body dies, you go, you're dead. That body in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, when God created Adam from the dirt, the scripture says God put life into that dirt body. He didn't breathe a soul into it. It's just like, see, we think our bodies 
it's just like um, uh, armor. You know, back in the days of King Edward or King Richard and all that and the knights and everything, we think it's an armor. And inside our bodies, which is an armor, is a soul. And we get that from Genesis. Where, that's where we're going to go at later on. In Genesis, where it says, God breathed into Adam's nostril and man became a living soul. King James, but actually it's the word being. We're going to get there. We think God gave him mouth-to-mouth -mouth receptation and put a soul in his body. That is not the Hebrew meaning of the word. Now, remember, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in what? Greek. Now, follow me now. See, we got to put aside our pride and our learnings from professors and universities and geniuses and see what the scripture says. Now, again, I repeat, if that library, if that commentary, if that professor, if that teacher agrees with the scripture, then you, you take note of it and you hold on to it. But when you see that they vary away from the, the, the translation of the Hebrew and the Greek and give only the English definition then we are most miserable people. Well, I mean, we can't, we can't, can't accept that. Now, the scripture teaches that Jesus says that he's going to receive us unto himself. Last week, we gave you scripture after scripture, like 2 Thessalonians 5 and 8, to be absent from the body is the presence of the Lord, present with the Lord. We told you what that means. Go back to the uh, last week video and you'll see what that means. Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter uh, what 1, we, we talked about these now, all right, we talked about St. John chapter 14 verses 1 to 3, there's many scriptures we talked about, but nowhere does the apostle Paul tells us that he states that when he died, he's going to go to heaven. Prophet and apostles had visions. Prophets and apostles were moved by the Holy Spirit so mightily that it felt as though they descended to heaven. It felt as though they was right beside Jesus. It felt as though they was in the presence of God. How many times have you prayed and you really prayed and you just trusted God in your prayer and it felt like you was with God in his presence. That's what the scripture says. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Now, let, see, I, I, I know this is a hard thing to swallow because after generation and generation and generation, we have accepted that man is part body, soul, and spirit. Not ignoring what the scriptures are saying. And we get this from men. We get this from schools and colleges and Bible seminars and, and, and commentary instead of searching the scripture. That teacher should have searched the scripture. That Bible teacher in the universities and schools and Sunday school, Bible school or whatever should have searched the scripture, should have did their homework. So what is happening is that we are just accepting it and we feast on it. It's the same thing that we come out of our mouths so freely and say, accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. When the scripture does not say accept, it says receive him as your Savior. As many as receive him, John 1 and 12, to them gave the power to become the sons of God. But we turn it around and say, accept Jesus Christ. See, the word accept, I said this so many times, the word accept means you have a part in it. Well, you say doesn't receive, received means that you don't have no part. You receive Christ because the spirit of God moved upon your heart and he drew you and you heard the word and God put faith in your heart because no one has saving faith. And you receive Christ as your savior. On our own intentions, on our own feelings, we will never come to Christ. We will never 
uh, 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 cry out to God and say, Lord, save me. Now, let me get back to the message here. All right. Not that I took God away from it, but I said earlier at the outset that if when a person dies and that soul leaves the body and goes to heaven, then that means when Jesus Christ comes back and you get your resurrected body, you're going to have to be judged twice. Because number one, you died, you already been judged. You come on straight to heaven. That's one judgment. So number two, when Jesus comes back and that soul gets into the body, then you got to stand before him again. Then that's the second judgment. There's no scripture for that. But we accept that. We do. We accept that because it's been told to us. That's it. Nobody gave us foolproof scripture that that's true. But we accept it because we got taught that way. Even I did. All right. But there's a that we're judged twice. So that means when a person dies without Christ and they go to heaven, all right, uh, dies without Christ, I'm sorry, and they go to hell. When Jesus Christ comes back and he raised the wicked dead up, then that person has to come out of Abraham or come out of hell or come out of purgatory or come out of limbo, come out of wherever he gone to and get into his body and stand before Jesus Christ. That common sense and reasoning, you heard what I said, right? Does that sound right? I mean, really, scripture, does that sound right? I mean, no, it doesn't. Now, to prove that, to prove that, remember, time after time and a time, I told you, the scripture teaches, and I told you repeatedly, that when Jesus died, he did not go to heaven. Regardless how we feel that Luke 20, is that 20 or 21 or what, 19, 19 or 20? Whatever, whatever scripture, 22, okay, you look it up. Remember when Jesus says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise? In the English translation, it sounds like a question, it sounds like a statement because of the English translation. But in the Greek, it's a question. In other words, it's the same question like Pilate, uh, what's his name? Agrippa put before Paul when Paul, when Agrippa says, Paul, you're trying to be, make me become a Christian? You're trying to persuade me to become a Christian? This is in the book of Acts. This is the same manner in which Jesus told the thief on the cross who already railed him and mocked him thinking that he's the king. If, you, if he's the king, if you if you're the king, save us and save, save, save us and save yourself. That's what the, the thief said, right? Okay. Earlier that day when they was crucified, he mocked Jesus and, and, and ridiculed and railed. The scripture teaches that. He railed Jesus. He mocked him. Then he turns around and said, Lord, remember me when you go into your kingdom. See, he knew he was getting ready to die. And he said, the only antidote for that is, I want to join you in your kingdom. And this is what Jesus said, Luke's gospel at the end. All right, search the scriptures. Today, you think you're going to be with me in paradise? That's a question. But the way that the King James and other translations, well, not the NIV and the authorized version, thank God for that. But the King James notably says that he asked him a question. Lord, remember me when you go into your kingdom. Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. All right. So, oh good, when I die, I'm going to paradise with Jesus because when Jesus died, he's going down to paradise or wherever paradise is. Now, can't you see well, you not, excuse me. You have to understand that Jesus already said that he's going to be in the earth for three days and three nights. Shall I quote that again? As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, in the grave. Okay. All right. Death is death. You're resting in peace. You're asleep. You're dead. 
And that's why in First Corinthians, in First Corinthians chapter 15, mark it down. Paul says in First Corinthians chapter 15, way back in verse um, uh, chapter, let's say chapter 15. And when he says about that, the disciples, many of us saw Jesus when he rose from the dead. Say, I want to get this. I don't want to quote it. I want you to see that I see it in the scriptures as you see it. First Corinthians 15 and 6 says this. And after that, he was seen above the 500 brethren at once. That's first Corinthians 15 and 6. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present. In other words, Paul says, as I write this, a lot of you guys are still alive. But notice, but some are falling asleep. Now, why didn't Paul say, oh, you know, some of y'all are alive and the others went to heaven. They died and went to heaven. He didn't say that. He said they fallen asleep because the word sleep, metaphorically, just like Jesus using in John chapter 11, follow me now. He said that Lazarus is dead. Well, if he's dead, Lord, leave him alone, leave him alone, leave him alone. Jesus said Lazarus is sleeping. Well, he said Lazarus is sleeping. I'm sorry. Lazarus is sleeping, but I'm going to wake him up. The disciples says, Lord, if he's sleeping, leave him alone. Who wants to be woke up, waking up when they're sleeping? Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Okay, all right. Now, we, we learn from Jesus that the word, when a person dies, they're asleep. No matter who you are, saved or unsaved, you're asleep. And the word sleep means you're dead. They're falling asleep. Now, drop down to verse 18, 1 Corinthians 15, 18. Follow me. It's a scripture now. This is not Sherman's doctrine or a Christian Bible chapel doctrine. This is the Bible's doctrine, the scriptures, okay? You don't fall out, you fall out with the scriptures, not with me. Now, here we go. Verse 18, then they also which are falling asleep. Now, why didn't he say went to heaven? Why? Here's the note. They which are falling asleep in Christ are perished. So, see, we got to find, we got to see that, the word that that the word of God teaches that when a person dies, you're gonna you're gonna be dead. We 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 must stop accepting Satan's lie. Oh, you're not gonna die. What did Jesus tell them? The day you eat of it, you shall surely what die. Okay. So if death is not death. It's when you die, you really going to heaven. There's one, there's no need for the resurrection. Two, death, it doesn't mean death. You, we have reinterpreted death. We have reinterpreted soul. We have reinterpreted hell. We have re reinterpreted heaven. Now, let's deal with the other section in which I told you I was going to go back to. And that, take, take your Bible. And go to Genesis chapter 1. Now, I know this is kind of hard to swallow for a lot of people. Stay up late tonight and study the scriptures and ask the Holy Spirit of God to lead you. All right? Okay? Don't call Dr. T. Don't call Dr. Z and Reverend Sister M. I mean, call the Holy Spirit of God and ask him, Lord, is this right? Follow me in the word of God. Okay, Genesis chapter one. Now, God himself had created the heavens and the earth, right? Genesis one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. He made the stars. He made everything. All right. He's coming down. He made the stars. He's made the moon. He, he, he made the, he, the waters and he, well, he divided the waters. Okay, what well, he did, made the waters and he divided the waters and called them seas and the dry land he called the land, the, the, uh, the dry land he called earth. Okay, we know that part. Now drop down to verse 20, Genesis 1 20. Now follow me now. Okay, now we're in the Old Testament. Now, since we're in the Old Testament, teachers either go to school and learn Hebrew or get a Hebrew lexicon with the English. That's what I got. Okay. Either, you got to do two. You got you to do one of them. Either get the Hebrew Bible with the 
English or go to school to learn Hebrew. Because if in order for you to be an effective teacher, you got to know Hebrew a little bit and Greek a little bit. Not master it, but a little bit. Because the, the author of the Bible is the Holy Spirit. And he will take that little that you have learned and allow you to grow on it because he's the author of the scriptures. Okay? Stop relying on Webster's Dictionary, the commentary. Okay? Stop relying on it for your final analysis of what it's saying. We, we, we get our final analysis for our sermons, for our Sunday school lessons, for our teachers, from a Sunday school book. That's where we get our analysis from, the last results. We get it from a Sunday school book, a commentary, or notes from a great preacher. Now, follow me now. Now, hear me now. Hear me very closely. I'm going to say it again. Unless that commentary, unless that footnote, unless that lesson, unless that teacher is following the scriptures and you see that they're following you and giving you scripture with scripture and it's been validated by the spirit of God and the scripture Accept, accept it. All right, Genesis chapter one, verse 20. Here we go. And God said, and of course the English word God is Jehovah, okay? And Jehovah said, he's not Jehovah, Jehovah, Lord Jehovah yet till after he made man, but he's just Jehovah, all right? Jehovah said, God, let the waters bring forth the abundantly moving creatures. Now, hear me. The word creature is the word nephesh. N-E-P-H-E-S-H. That's the Greek word. Look it up in the strong concordance. Nephesh. What does nephesh mean? It means in the Hebrew, living being, living creature, or the word creature, okay? Now, all right, follow me now, all right? No, it doesn't mean living soul. Doesn't mean living soul. That's what, we try, that's what we're trying to get you to see here because I don't mind saying the word soul, but you, you see, we read, Classified the word soul to mean a, a part that is immortal in us. That when it dies, it leaves the body, but there's no scripture for that. If your soul is immortal, then why did Jesus bring, when he died, he brought life and immortality to man? First, First Timothy chapter 6 tells us that. I mean, we got to study the scriptures. If you already have immortality in your soul, then we don't really die. Because immortality means you cannot die. I, I'm, I'm trying to get through to you. I'm, I'm, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and I pray God that you will just put aside your differences and see that if you already got immortality, why are you seeking for immortality? Why do you need a resurrected body? Okay, that's the pivot point here. Now let's get back to the scripture here. God created and let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that have life. Okay, move on. Verse 21. And God created, created Barak. Okay, Barak. God created whales. And every, now here it says what? Living creatures that move, which the waters brought forth abundantly. Now follow me now. Look at verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after his kind. Cattle, 
creeping things, beast of the earth after its kind. And in verse 25, and God made the beast of the earth after its kind and the cattle and their kind and every what thing that creepeth upon the earth after his, its kind. And God saw that it was good. All right. Now, you're following me now, right? Genesis 1, 20 to 24. We already established that the word creature, living creature itself, it's an English word, which means nephesh. All right, now let's move on to verse 26. Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish and the sea and the fowl of the air. See, remember last week we went into 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and we pulled out the different categories of creatures. Man, beasts, fowls of the air, and fish in the water. The fishes, anything that lived in. And we, we concluded, this was last week now, we concluded that in each of these creatures, man, beasts, fowls in the air, and fowl, be, uh, creatures in the sea, they all four had one thing in common. God had to give them life. Life, now follow me now. Now last week I gave you a word that I said I was going to um, give you the right pronunciation of this. It's called Nef Shama. It's a Hebrew word for life or breath. Nef Shama. N S H A M A H. Okay, that's the Hebrew word. Now follow me now. Follow me. Now, when God gave these creatures, Nephesh, verses 20 to 24, when he made them, he gave them life. Right. Life is breath. Neshama. Neshama. In Neshama. He gave them life. Breath. Follow me now. Please follow. And God said, verse 26, let us make man in our image, okay? So in verse 27, and God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Now, okay, that ain't finished yet. Let's move on. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Chapter 2. See, this is scripture with scripture now. This is expository teaching. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4, Okay. And the Lord God formed man. Now, now, remember now what he did to the beasts, to the birds, to the fish. He created, he formed, and gave them life, breath. All right, now follow me now. Neshama. Watch this now. Nefesh and Neshama. Those are the two Hebrew words. Follow me now. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Of course, you know, the dust is dirt. Okay. And God breathed into his nostril. Follow me now. The breath of life and man became a living being. Now, remember now, in the King James, it says so. Don't get thrown off with that now. Nefesh means living being, living creature, or the word creature. Right. Nefesh. Man became, so what we are seeing here, and then follow me now, that as God made the fish and gave them life, as God made the beasts on the earth and gave them life, as God made the fowls of the air and gave them life, now he's making man. We think because we are made different than animals, we must have a soul and animals don't have a soul. But you can't differentiate that in the word of God. God, man, both man and being, man and creatures, living creatures, beasts, fowls, fishes, are creatures. Man is a creature. You can go to any anthropologist course, take any anthropologist course, you take a course 
even in bi biology, right? what is it biology? Yeah, the study of man or anthropology, all that, and, and anatomy, you're going to see that the professor, you're going to hear him say that man is a creature, which he is. That's the Hebrew word nephesh. Now, God breathed into his nostril, here it is, breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, you have to understand, you have to understand this now, because when you're traveling to Genesis, through Genesis, okay, you're going to see that that same word, breathe, is applied to both man and beast. The same way God gave life to animals, God gave life to man. So, does animals have a soul? Does man have a soul? No. Man is a soul. Animals is a soul. If you want to look at it in the biblical technology of it, we have reinterpreted the word soul as a immortal spirit, something that is in us that when it leaves, it goes to heaven. No scripture for it. But for centuries, we have accepted it in the church. Now, I ain't starting nothing new. There's plenty of ministers that can validate what I say. That they can, if they have the courage to read God's word and stand up. Because when you stand for the scriptures, the bishop, the pastor, the superintendent of the Sunday school is going to demote you. You might even get kicked out of, out of church, okay, because you're standing for the truth. When you stand up and say, no, you don't have to tarry for the Holy Ghost. You don't have to be baptized for the, for the Holy Ghost. You don't have to join the church. You don't have to take the mass. You don't have to believe in purgatory. You don't have to say Hail Mary. You don't have to take the Lord's Supper. You don't have to join the church. You don't have to shake the preacher's hand. You're in big trouble in the church. And that's the same thing that happened to Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the prophets of old, the apostles, Jesus Christ, and you too that stand for the truth of God's word. You're not going to be accepted. When we started this lesson, I already told you, Isaiah 53 and 1, Lord, who have believed our report? And to whom the arm of the Lord, the arm of the Lord is deliverance, the gospel, salvation. Who's going to believe it? Who's going to believe it? Genesis chapter 7. Turn to Genesis chapter 7. I'm trying to make this very easy and complete. And I'm going to show you in the book of Psalms what I'm talking about also. Genesis chapter 7, verse 21. Follow me, please. We'll go up to verse 15 first. Genesis 7, 15. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh. Now remember, see, all we know, two animals, two by two, went in. They don't see the scripture tells that's half truth. Because God told Noah to take seven clean animals, male and female, for sacrifices. So when you get them out the ark, you can sacrifice. But take the unclean, see how we remember things that are unclean? The unclean animals were taken into the ark two by two. But the clean animals was taken into the ark seven, 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 seven male and seven female. Read Genesis very closely now, chapter six and seven. Okay. Let's move on. Verse 15, Genesis 7, 15. And they went into Noah, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein the breath of God, the breath of life, see that word again, Nishama, there it is, the Hebrew word again, the breath of life, drop down to verse 21. And all flesh, and remember, God fled the earth, he flood the world. Now remember this, in the flood, when it started raining, not the animals, because God gave man a superior conscience over animals. That's what he talked about when he made them in the image of God, okay? Those human beings, so stubborn, so wicked, did 
not even allow their children, their teenagers, their pregnant little their pregnant girls, whatever, to get in the ark. People were mean then as people mean today. Oh, sure, they were banging on the ark, banging on the door. No, I called, don't let, even though I didn't reject you, open the door and let my baby in, let my daughter in, let my children in. See, the Bible says in Genesis, and the Lord shut the door. Noah couldn't open the ark the door anyway. I said all that to say this, all flesh, human flesh, beast flesh, animal flesh, fowl flesh, fish, everything, it died. Everything, it died. It died. Everything, it died. Now, you need to do some survey and some understanding how that animals need the fishes, birds, and beasts of the earth. Dogs, cat, cow, mule, whatever, donkey, horse, whatever. They need to breathe. They need to breathe. They need air just like we need air. And if they don't get that sufficient amount of air, they're going to die. Behind me is an aquarium, and I got fish in there. And I got a stone, bubble stone in there because it, it brings in air and bubbles for the fish because they need air. You think just because they're in the water, they ain't breathing? Come on, be real. The scripture says they're breathing. Dogs are breathing. Snakes breathe. Every, every living creature breeze. Verse 21 of Genesis 7, 21. All the flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of the fowl. Follow me now. I'm, this is not Sherman's doctrine. This is Bible doctrine. Everything that moved upon the earth died. Fowl, cattle, and other beasts, and every creeping thing. I don't care if it's a spider, it's an ant, a roach, bumblebee, locust, whatever creep and crawl on the earth, it needed air. It died. Bam. It died. God killed everything. Every creeping thing that creeped upon the earth, every and every man that did not get into that ark, every beast that did not get into that ark, Every living creature, a word creature, nephesh, died. All flesh. Verse 22. Here it is. All in whose nostril was the breath of life. See, jump back up to verse 15. See that? See, breath of life. Go back to Genesis 120. Creatures, breath, God gave them breath. Life, man, Genesis 1, 26, Genesis 2, God breathed into my Adam and he became a what? Okay. That's not hard to follow. Now. If we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, there it is. And all nostrils was the breath of life. See, and all was in the dry land died. And every living, living creature was destroyed upon the face of the ground, both man, cattle, creeping thing, and the fowls of the heaven, they were destroyed from the earth. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Well, let's turn to Joshua chapter 10, verse 40. Yeah, let's see, like Paul said to Titus that we have to stop the mouths of these gangsters and people saying, oh, that's not, that's not the Bible, that's not right, that's not oh, what are you talking about. Okay, let's go to Joshua chapter 10. What am I talking about? I'm talking about how we're proving, as we told you earlier, through the scriptures, that when Jesus Christ comes back, he's not coming back with souls of the believers. He's coming back with the inheritance, the promises, the blessings that he's giving, going to give us when he returns and when he raises us up from the dead, he's going to give us that. It, it, it makes no sense when he says, if I go and come again, I will receive you unto myself. It doesn't make sense. But we tend to 
think that in 2 Corinthians 5 and 8, absent from the body is present with the Lord. We think Paul is talking about when we die, we're going to be with Jesus in heaven. That scripture and, and in the rest of the scriptures that we are lured to thinking that that's talking about, we have left the context of what Paul was talking about and have jumped the gun thinking that, oh yeah, when I die, I'm going to be with Jesus. Then we're saying actually also that death is the door. Well, I'm going, I'm going to take my life. I'm going to commit suicide. I'm going to heaven. Okay, yeah, when you die, you dead. But we like to believe that because of our weak faith. And I'm, that's, that's what it is. But we got to start believing that God's word, that he has a place for us, which is heaven. See, we, we even think in Genesis, well, Revelation chapter 21, that a new Jerusalem coming out of the high sky. And that's where we're going to, you know, that's the place in John 14 in my father's house. See, when Jesus used that allegory, that metaphor in John chapter 14 and 1, he was using it that said when Jewish people got married, they didn't go to Brooklyn. The son didn't go to Brooklyn. He didn't go to Hawaii. He didn't go to Germany. He didn't go down south. He didn't go to West Baltimore to get away from his parents. Jewish people made the practice when they got married, they moved within their father's house. Either they built a room next door or they went upstairs or they built something upstairs on the second floor because remember that the rooms in those days in the Old Testament were flat rooms. That's what he says in my father's house are many mansions. That's the imagery that he's talking about. He's not actually talking about Jesus went and Jesus being a carpenter and he's in heaven making a great city and it's a holy Jerusalem that's coming out of the sky and it's got pearl gates and they got uh, uh, shiny floors and gold and transparent this and the new Jerusalem is the church study Revelation chapter 19 you got to study and that's what we're doing in our Sunday school lesson on Sunday mornings and Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock the Sunday revelations see we we don't. We are a people. I believe we don't study. We study more to get our degree, our certificate, and whatever we, we want to be, than we do in the Bible. This is why in the book of Psalms, David says, "My heart painteth for the Lord." He said, "He says, as a deer painteth for water." Still waters, remember, deer does not go and drink water out of a running water, never. Because as they drink water, it's got to be still and quiet because their ears are up listening for a lion or some creature to come. It's got to be still. As a deer, a heart, H-A-R-T, a heart, okay? as the deer paints for still waters, so here it is. So my soul pays it for the word of God. Well, there's the word soul, preacher. Well, see, then that moves us to, I already told you, Joshua, right? Well, well before we go to Psalm, let's, let's deal very quickly with Joshua. Okay, look at Joshua chapter 10. Let me just highlight what it's talking about. God, Joshua chapter 10. You got it? Okay. In Joshua chapter 10, God told Joshua that he's going to deliver all the five, six, or how many kings in his hands. That was a lot. It was a big army for Joshua. But God assured Joshua that he's going to be delivered. Joshua chapter 10. All right, there were five kings, verse 16. Joshua 10, 16. All right, five of them. Right. And each five king had their armies coming against Israel. All right. Starting at verse 8, the English word pronoun is going to be used, them and they. Follow me now. Them and they. Follow me. And the Lord said to Joshua, fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand, and there shall not a man of them 
came before thee. Now, I'm not going to read all the whole chapter because he keeps using the word them, 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 them. Okay, verse 15, 16. But these five kings fled and hid themselves in the caves. When Joshua found out, he went into the caves and took them out and killed them. He killed them. He killed them. Now, what's the point? Keep on moving. Keep on reading. Keep on reading. Verse 28. That day, Joshua took Makeda, I'm not pronouncing that right, but just follow me now, and smote it with the, see, Makeda, that's a, a part of the land, okay, and the people in it, and smoked the, and smoked, killed, the word smoke, S M O T E, meaning killed, okay, and smote it with the edge of the sword. He killed everything. He just killed, just went in there and just killed everybody. The children, the, the beasts, the, the, Kill everything. I want you to kill everything. I told Joshua, when you conquer a land, kill it, destroy it, burn it, get rid of it. And smote it with the edge of the sword, and the king thereof, he utterly destroyed them. Follow me now. And all, uh oh, here we go, King James again. And all the souls that were therein. Now, he just got finished saying them, right? Them, 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 starting in verse 8. Them, 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 them. Kill them, kill the people, kill, kill the kings, kill them, 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 them. He just did it. Now, look at here. And all the souls that were therein. Did you, you, you see that? See how the translators cleverly changed the word from them to souls? When the word soul is them? Follow me now. Now, what is a them? A person. Nefesh. Don't forget that now. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 7, Nephesh. Remember this now. All right. Then Joshua, verse 29, passed from Mekida and all Israel with him unto Libna and fought against Libna, all the people there. And the Lord delivered that into his hands also, and the king thereof, and the land of Israel, in the, into the hands of Israel. Follow me now. And he smote it with the edge of the sword. Now, here it is. All them that were therein, he let none remain in it. You notice I changed the word from soul to them because that's what's supposed to be there. Now, I, again, I don't mind using the word soul. And, you, and, and sometimes I might slip up and use the word soul. soul. But you better remember that when I say the word soul, I'm talking about a person, a body. Not something that is in me that when it dies, it's going to leave. Now, time is precious. Verse 40. So Joshua made all the country of the... So Joshua smote all the country of the hills and of the south, and of the vale, and of the springs, and all their kings. And he left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathe. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. All that breathe. So if we do have an immortal soul in us, it must be breathing. No. No, that don't sound right. I'm breathing. My body is breathing. No, 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 no. It's your soul that's breathing. See, see the contradiction. See, the, see, see, see here. And all that breathe as the Lord had of God of Israel com commanded. All right. We're going to close. We, but bear with me one more, two more times, and, I, and then we're going to close. See, I'm, I'm trying to prove a point here. So I want you to now turn to the book of Psalms. Turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 7. And while you're turning, and with your ink pen, also write down Psalm 35, Psalm 37, Psalm 63. I'm going to say that again as we go on. Psalm 7, right. Psalm 7, I'm just, it's, it's all throughout the book of Psalm, but I'm giving you some that I'll show you just like the book of Joshua, how the King James changed the word soul to make it look like uh, immaterial, spirit-like ghost that leaves your body and goes to heaven with Jesus. When, when, when Acts chapter 
two tells us that David is in the grave. I mean, it's it's amazing, but we don't study. Uh, Psalms 35, I told you. Uh, Psalms, what else did I say? 63. Uh, we're going to give you those. And those Psalms, you read on your own. But Psalms chapter 7, I want you to mark the pattern here. Mark the pattern in the King James, okay? Because I'm reading from the King James. If I was to read from the uh, NIV or the New American Standard Bible or the other Bible other than the King James, it's not going to say this. That's proof, that's, that's proof positive that the translators sometimes change a word to fit their denomination or their, their, their way of thinking instead of writing it according to the Hebrew or the Greek. That doesn't violate the word of God. That doesn't say that the word of God is not inspired. We, the word of God remains inspired. This is God's word. But you see, just like commentary and translators, they can have faults. And that's why we need to study to show ourselves to prove. Psalm 7, oh my, oh Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me, me, save me from all that persecute me. Talking about the body, right? So when a person come after you and persecute you, they're going to get your body, persecute your body, say bad things about you, your body, right? Okay, let's go to verse 2. Psalm 7 and 2. Least he tear my soul like a lion. Where did you? How you gonna get? You, you got that much? Your enemy got that much power that they gonna rip your soul up? Come on now, and, and, and read on. Verse four. If I have, if I rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, if I deliver him that without cause is my enemy. Verse five. Let the enemy persecute. Uh oh, what? My soul. How are you going to persecute your soul when your soul is in your body? And take it. Come on. How did, see, we got to think biblically and think soundly. Hmm. We're going to get in a lot of trouble here about our churches. Look, they're going, they, they probably send me a lot of email. What are you doing? What are you starting? What are you, you, you're a heretic. You're, okay, well, that's okay. See, I'd rather be in trouble with them. Than to be in trouble with God. Okay, one more verse. Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. See, even the word anger, see, that's a human word because you know how I get anger? You know, we get angry. We're going to talk about that in counseling on Friday mornings, next week, or week after next. Anger. We apply our anger like God get anger. God, even in Psalm 7 11, God is angry with the wicked every day. He's like Zeus. I'm gonna throw a lightning bolt at you. You make me sick. That's human anger. Anger, when it's applied to God, is meaning he's displeased. You think God has a temper tantrum and kick the wall and throw things at you and and and, and, and show people? See, when we get angry, we want to get revenge. We're gonna hit them. We're gonna say something. We're gonna cuss. We're gonna do something. That's human anger. Is God like man? Of course not. But here it is, arise, O Lord, in thine anger, and lift up thyself because of the rage of my enemies. The word rage is anger, ain't it? And awake from awake for me to judgment that you have commanded. Wow. So this in these other psalms, I will bless the Lord, O my soul. I mean, see I we got to start thinking biblically and thinking silently. Now, we're going to close out. I used all the time that I had to show you what is man. Is man a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit? And people say, well, first, that's a Romans chapter, what, 5, uh, 20, something, or 19, or 20. First, that's Romans 5. Didn't Paul say this? I pray that your body, soul, and spirit be... Why do we assume that Paul said that in the Greek? In other words, in order for me to prove a point, I'm going to say body, soul, and spirit. 
But Paul said, I pray God that your being be sanctified, set apart. Then here's the scripture again. Fear not man that is able to destroy. Uh, don't worry about man that is able to destroy your body, but fear him that's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Wow, now, what are you going to do with that scripture? The same thing I'm going to do with when Jesus says in Psalms 10, 16, and Acts chapter 2, you will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. That's the same way I'm going to deal with that. Just like that. Did Jesus have a soul and his soul went to hell? If it did, it, broke, it, 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 it contradicts and breaks scriptures. Scriptures must be compatible. Scripture must interpret scripture. For one scripture to say something and another scripture to say something else, we might as well take the living Bible, the word of God, and throw it in the trash can. There is no contradiction in the scripture. There is no incompatibility in the scriptures. There is no fault in the scriptures. We make the fault. We are infallible. We make the errors. When we preach, when we teach, when we translate, when we whatever, with the scriptures, we make the errors. But the word of God is pure. The word of God is just. The word of God is wholesome. The word of God is inspired. God breathes. All right. So, as we close it out, the resurrection of the dead, if there be no resurrection, if we just go to heaven or hell when we die, we do not need a resurrection. Why? Because we're already immortal. What do we need an immortal soul and an immortal body? A mortal soul coming down from with Jesus, hooking up, first Thessalonians chapter 4, with an immortal body. No scripture now. But that's our assumption. Just like it's a theory. That's just it's, it's the same thing like the old man has been on this earth for six billion years. Come on, now. but we, we we believe it. Well, the sun is this, and we believe it. Like John says, we believe the witness of man before we believe the witness of God. Now, next week. We are going to move on in our lessons, and I want you to read uh, page uh, from page seven. You saw it read all the way up to chapter seven, page seventeen, and I want you to read uh, page seventeen uh, through. If you have your notes, let's see seventeen. I don't want to give you too much. All right, to twenty-one, and then what we're going to do. Lord's willing, is we're going to move on to Revelations chapter 20. And we're going to look at chapter 20. Well, we're going to look at chapter 19, 20, 21, and 22 in, seg in segments. And get a clear understanding of the second coming of Jesus, how he's coming, not when, but how he's coming, the manner that he's coming, the resurrection of the dead, the judgment of believers and sinners, wicked. And Revelation chapter 21, 22, the New Jerusalem, as we're going to see. Lord, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We bless your name, O oh God, and we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Father, that it takes studying, sheer studying of the word of God. We cannot compromise. We cannot follow the traditions of man. We cannot follow the traditions of the elders. We cannot be following, like the Pharisees, the traditions of the elders. Matthew chapter 15. We must follow the word of God. No, Lord, we're going to get in trouble. No things is going to turn about for the worse. But we thank you for the truths of your word. Open, continue to open our hearts in the word of God and enlighten us in the spirit of God. And blessed is your name forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now join us for Sunday school, 10 o'clock this Sunday.
Lord's, Lord's Day. And of course, after Sunday school, about 11.15, we will have our morning worship. Uh, that's Father's Day, which is the 21st. And on that day, we will be doing, on Facebook, the Lord's Supper. So you guys going to join us on this coming Sunday. Make sure that you have your food of the vine, grape juice, whatever you want to use, and bread, cracker, whatever. Because we're going to take the Lord's Supper this coming Sunday, June the 15th, uh, after the Lord's Supper, after the morning worship at 11.15. All right? God bless you.